ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your break. So now let us start the first session. And session one, titled Targets and Instruments, will be moderated by Professor Thomas J. Sargent from New York University, who is also serving as a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution of Stanford University. And as you all know, he was awarded the 2011 Nobel Prize in Economics, and he has been making tremendous contributions as a BOK's distinguished advisor to ensure successful hosting of our international conferences year after year. So thank you so much once again, Professor Sargent. Now please take the microphone away. Please welcome him with a big hand. Okay, here's the deal. Uh, paper presenters have 20 minutes, discussants have 10 minutes, and bad things are going to happen if you don't obey those restrictions. <laughs> okay, so the way we're going to do it is uh, the f first uh, Martin Uribe is going to speak, uh, and then his discussant Giovanni Della Ariccia is going to discuss him. And then Juan Pablo is going to speak, and then his discussant Juan Ku Kong is going to speak. So here we go. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. This paper is um, motivated by the observation that many countries are experiencing significantly below target inflation, in many cases deflation for many years, and uh, low interest rates, in many cases zero interest rates for many years. Japan, uh, Western Europe are examples. And um, so one question is, how could these countries implement monetary policy to uh, achieve target levels of inflation in a more or less permanent fashion? How could they lift their economies out of deflation? The Fisher relationship uh, says that in, in the long run, Inflation and the nominal interest rate are linked in an almost one-to-one -one relationship. And um, so, in principle, these countries could increase the nominal interest rate permanently, and sooner or later, the inflation rate would increase by the same amount. The problem is what would happen in the transition if a central bank decides to normalize rates, say, from zero to normal rates like in the range of four to six percentage points. And that is precisely the uh, point of the present paper. That the question of what happens um, if a country or a central bank that has zero or low rates normalizes interest rates can be or pertains to a broader question, which is what is the effect of an interest rate shock? And here with this two-by-two two table, I summarize more or less what we know from theory. In the first row, I have a... So the question is, what happens when uh, there is an increase in the nominal interest rate? The first row uh, shows what happens if that increase in the nominal interest rate is understood to be transitory. Well, then theory says that in the long run, inflation, which I denote here by pi, um, should not be affected in the long run because the shock is transitory. And in the short run, the um, effect of a transitory increase in the nominal interest rate should be contractionary, so inflation should go down. Now, what happens if the nominal interest rate increase is perceived to be permanent? Well, the Fisher effect says that in the long run, uh, inflation should increase one for one when the increase in the nominal interest rate and the question is, what happens in the short run or in the transition when there is a permanent increase in the nominal interest rate? And uh, in the past few years, there has been a number of papers, I have contributed some of them with Stephanie, suggesting that in standard models, that the, like the Neo-Keynesian model, uh, an increase in the nominal interest rate that is perceived to be permanent has an immediate has the effect of an immediate increase in inflationary expectations. That is what 
I'm gonna call today the Neo Fisher effect. So the Neo Fisher effect is element 2, 2 of this table, and the Fisher effect is element uh, 2, 1. So before talking about the Neo Fisher effect, let me refresh for you quickly the Fisher effect. So what I have here is a graph in which in the horizontal axis I have long run averages, 25 year averages of inflation in the vertical line, 25 year averages of the nominal interest rate for 25 OECD countries. And you see that there is a very strong and clear relationship, uh, positive relationship, almost one to one between these two variables. So the idea from this is that if the central bank were to increase permanently the nominal interest rate forever, the inflation rate at some point will uh, increase. Now the question is, what would happen in the short run? That is the neo fisher effect, uh, which uh, is the focus of this uh, presentation from an empirical uh, perspective. So to understand the neo fisher effect, I'm gonna write down an empirical model which is presented in this slide. And on the top row, uh, as many small empirical monetary models, I'm gonna have three variables, real output, the inflation rate, and uh, the policy rate, which could be the, in the case of the US, would be the federal funds rate, for instance, uh, which I denote YT, pi T, and IT, respectively. And I'm going to assume that there is a stochastic variable called XNT, which I'm gonna call a permanent non-monetary shock that is co-integrated with real output. And that the, so that the difference between YT and XNT, which I call Y hat T, is a stationary variable. I'm gonna assume also that there is a permanent monetary shock, which I denote XMT, which is co-integrated with both the inflation rate and the nominal interest rate, so that the difference between the inflation rate and this permanent shock, which I call pi hat t, is a stationary variable. And the same for the difference between the nominal interest rate and this permanent monetary shock, which I call i hat t. So these hat t variables are all stationary. On the second row, I postulate the law of motion of these three stationary variables. And I assume that they follow an autoregressive process of the type I wrote on the second row, wrote on the second row of this uh, slide with driving forces, four exogenous driving forces. The first two are the growth rates of the permanent shocks. So the growth rate of the output, stochastic output trend and the growth rate of the permanent monetary shock these two growth rates are stationary variables, and two transitory shocks, a monetary transitory shock, which I denote ZMT, and a non-monetary transitory shock, which I call ZNT. And I'm gonna assume that these four driving forces follow a univariate AR1 processes, as I write on the third row of this slide. So this matrix is Lambda and gamma are gonna be assumed to be, uh, assumed to be diagonal. So that is the model. There are two permanent shocks, one non-monetary shock, one monetary shock. Output is stationary. Once you uh, subtract that permanent shock, the nominal interest rate and inflation are co-integrated with the monetary permanent shock. And then these detrended variables follow this autoregressive process. And I would like to take this model to the data. The problem is that this model is entirely cast in terms of unobservable variables because I don't observe the detrended variables, the hatted, the variables with the hat, and I don't observe the trends, I don't observe the, the driving forces. So I would like you to think of this system as the state equation in a state space representation. I will exploit, therefore, the fact that this model has precise predictions for variables that we do observe to write down a set of observable variables, uh, observable equations, sorry. And the three observables that I'm going to use are the growth rate of output, uh, 
the interest rate inflation differential and the change in the nominal interest rate. So, for instance, the growth rate, and at the bottom of this slide, I have the observation equations. Uh, the growth rate of output, for instance, is equal to the growth rate of the, of the trended output plus the growth rate of the trend. The interest rate inflation differential is the same as the uh, differential of the respective uh, the trended variables, i hat minus pi hat. And the change in the nominal interest rate is equal to the change in the hatted version of the interest rate plus the change in the permanent monetary shock XMT. So these three equations link, obs link observables to unobservables. And I can therefore use familiar techniques, for instance, not necessarily, but for instance, the Kalman filter to write down, to, to compute the likelihood of this data. And uh, I can therefore estimate and make inferences with this model. If I impose priors, I could uh, apply patient techniques to estimate uh, this model. So let me tell you uh, what um, identification assumptions I make. I wrote them down, down here. Uh, the first three we are already familiar with are the cointegration relationships. Output is cointegrated with the permanent non-monetary shock. Inflation and the nominal interest rate are cointegrated with the permanent monetary shock. And then I will add two more identification assumptions that are going to allow me to identify the transitory monetary shock. And uh, these two uh, additional identification assumptions say that the a transitory increase in the nominal interest rate has a non-positive impact effect on output and inflation. Okay, so with this in mind, I could now go ahead and estimate this model. I will estimate it first on U.S. data, post-war U.S. data. And these are the results. So what I have here are four panels. I would like you to focus on the top right panel first because that is the effect on inflation of a transitory shock, which is the standard, the standard shock that we know from the, from the literature. The broken red light is uh, the input response of the interest rate, of the policy rate, to a transitory interest rate shock. So the interest rate increases by 1% on impact and then dies out. And as you can see, the effect on inflation is the standard one. Inflation falls, and um, if you look now at the bottom right panel, output also falls. So a transitory increase in the nominal interest rate has the conventional effects that we all learn from macro 101. Now, if the shock is perceived, if the increase in the interest rate is perceived to be permanent, the dynamics are very different. Those are displayed on the left side of this graph, of this slide. So if you look at panel 1-1, one, one, the, the top left panel, uh, it shows with a broken red light the dynamics of a permanent increase in the normal interest rate. So this is a central bank that says, I'm going to normalize interest rates and I'm going to increase the normal interest rate permanently by 1% gradually, in this case, that is what comes out of the model. And what you see is that that increase in the nominal interest rate has an immediate positive effect on inflation. So inflation increases immediately, um, and in two quarters or three, it's already at its long run higher level consistent with the Fisher effect. So this model predicts that a normalization of interest rates uh, causes inflation to go up immediately. That's not worsen the deflationary problem. And output doesn't fall. In fact, output uh, has a, s a small uh, increase. So by announcing a permanent increase in nominal interest rate, the central bank is able to reflate the economy quickly without output loss. Look at... Um, <clears throat> 
what happens with real interest rates, these are the input responses of the real interest rate. In the case of a transitory monetary shock, in line with, say, new Keynesian models with a Taylor rule, the real interest rate initially increases, whereas in the case of a increase in the normal interest rate that is per perceived to be permanent, the real interest rate, uh, the transition, the, the the uh, transitional dynamics of the real interest rate um, are um, low, low interest rates. So that is consistent with output not falling in the uh, initial transition. I also estimate the model using Japanese post-war data, and the results that I obtain are very similar. So the interpretation of this slide is the same as in the US case, the right portion of the slides, for instance, the top right panel displays the e effect of a transitory monetary shock. And as you can see, the nominal interest rate goes up by 1% transitorily, inflation falls below trend, and output falls. So this shock has a contractionary effect, exactly as in the conventional uh, view. Whereas a permanent normalization of rates generates reflation quickly, so the, in, the inflation rate goes up uh, quickly without output loss. Output doesn't fall, as you can see in the left bottom panel. Okay, so these are the essential uh, or central results of this uh, paper. Here's the real interest rate, which as I showed you before in the case of the US, in the case of Japan is the same. Uh, a transitory increase in the nominal interest rate increases real rates in the transition, whereas an interest rate increase that is perceived to be permanent has a, uh, if, uh, causes a, a, a fall in the nominal interest rate, in the real interest rate. So let me uh, conclude here. What I did today was to postulate an empirical model with permanent and transitory monetary shocks, and this, I estimated that model using US and Japanese data, and the dynamics predicted by the model are in line with the prediction that a normalization, the announcement of a normalization of nominal rates, if it is gradual and credible, that is to say if the central bank correctly transmits that this normalization is permanent, is associated with a quick increase in the inflation rate without output loss. Now, what this is relevant because the discussion of what would be the cost of normalizing rates has been, in my opinion, focused from the perspective of what is the effect of a transitory increase in the nominal interest rate. So the idea is that if the Central Bank of Japan, say, or the Central Bank of Korea were to increase rates, it would worsen the low inflation problem, it would worsen the low growth problem, but that logic is based on the dynamics of transitory increases in the nominal interest rate. Once we change the focus and try to understand uh, what are the effects of shocks that are perceived to be permanent, the effects are very different. So these empirical results that I provided today come to complement this new literature that is theoretical in nature, uh, arguing uh, that um, standard models uh, feature the uh, neo feature effect. Okay, I'm gonna stop here. Giovanni. Uh, let me first thank the Bank of Korea for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here. I already learned a lot. And uh, given I'm told that the, there is press, at least not in the room, but seeing this, you never know, I need to read a disclaimer. The views in this presentation are mine only and do not necessarily represent those of the fund, its management, or its board. <laughs> 
Uh, I have another disclaimer. I'm a corporate finance person. And uh, when I was asked to discuss this paper, I admit I knew very, very little about neo fisherian approach to monetary policy. I think I learned a lot in the process. Rudy Dorbush used to tell us the difference between first-year students and second-year students is that the first-year students do not know. Second-year students do not know that they do not know. So I, I hope this doesn't apply to me in this particular case. But um, uh, here it goes. I'm going to do three things about this paper, which I find fascinating from many points of view. First, I'm going to quickly go through the theory behind the estimates. Then I'm going to comment on some of the empirical assumptions and then discuss the policy implications of the paper. Um, so this is a paper that is, I would say, is a, at the minimum policy relevant and maybe, maybe policy critical in the sense that where, oh. um, if, if the neo fisherian view of monetary policy is right, I, I hope to convince you through my next nine minutes that we have been doing many, many wrong things. Uh, since 2008. So this is the, the theory in a nutshell. So you have a Fisher equation that links uh, the nominal and real interest rate uh, in steady state over the long run. Um, the assumption is that my, uh, monetary policy is neutral in steady state, and so a shock, a permanent shock to inflation has to be reflected in a permanent shock to the nominal interest rate and vice versa. And then if you have a rational agent, they will anticipate this movement, and so inflation will adjust in the same direction, even in the short run, which is why, as Martin showed it, in theory, you shouldn't have a negative impact of a permanent shock to nominal interest rates, even, even in, the, in the short run. So if you, if you buy this, and this is common to models from very different traditions, including standard DSG models that have been the workhorse of monetary policy uh, in many, many central banks and certainly at the fund, uh, you, you had to come to the, one of the two, these two conclusions. Either we are using the wrong models or we are using the right models in the wrong way. There is no way out. So if you read the, read the literature, there are three ways in which people try to get out of, of this. Uh, one, uh, I think the most analytically sophisticated is by uh, Woodford and Schmidt. Essentially, you put a limit to rational expectations. And I think this, to some extent, is related to how long the long run is. So how many years do you think you need to get to the steady state. And if this is many, many years or quarters, uh, I think it's more plausible to say that there is a component of expectations that may be, may be adaptive, and you break, you break the link there. The second way is that you, to say that it's very hard to peg nominal interest rate credibly. On top of this, there is a technical problem of, of having unstable equilibria, but there are people found solutions for that. But it's, it's, uh, it's hard to believe that, you know, the central bank can peg the interest rate for the next 10 years, say. It, maybe it's impossible to convince markets of such a rule. I think this is not particularly sophisticated, but it's out there. I think the third one, which I think is fascinating and dangerous at the same time, is to play with neutrality and to say, well, uh, it's not true that monetary policy is neutral. It's an artifact that we have been used very successfully to prevent politicians uh, to use it for nefarious objectives, but you can make many, many examples in which think about the financial boom where, you know, they, in Spain, a number of kids would drop out of school to go work in the financial sector, in, in, sorry, in the construction sector during the real estate boom fueled by the credit boom. And then when that came down, of course, the economy doesn't, didn't look like it looked before, and if monetary policy has stopped the boom, you would have had a different equilibrium. I think another way to think about this is to flip the example that Martin had. Think about a country with very high inflation and think about experimenting and saying, okay, we are going to fix the interest rate, nominal interest rate at 3% forever. Inflation is at 45. You can think about a country, you know, the same in the southern hemisphere at the moment. And uh, if you do that, maybe you generate 
and you're not fully credible with this, even if the, the model is, is right, you may have a, a total run from the currency and dollarization to the point that you don't end up in a steady state that looks like a normal one. So let me, let me switch to the empirical evidence and, and discuss a little bit the assumption. So the, the, what I find as the uh, main issue with the way that the paper is designed is how you identify a shock to the a permanent and non-transitory shock to the nominal interest rate. And given this is co-integrated with inflation, it's, very, it's basically impossible to say whether this is a shock to ex inflation expectations or a shock to the nominal interest rate. And indeed, there is a paper that, that is cited in this one by the Michaelis and Jacoviello where they use a very similar structure to discuss what is the effect of an increase in the inflation target. And basically, you, you get identical long-term dynamics. And, and here is, you know, that is where, you know, you have to be careful. I, I think the evidence is overwhelming in terms of uh, the effects of a non-transitory monetary shock, but whether the monetary shock is to the interest rate or inflation expectations is hard to tell. I think the second point is that this is a very long time period and there were several structural breaks probably in the relationship among some of the variables. And uh, it'd be interesting to study sub-periods to see what happens. In, in particular, I'm thinking about changes in the monetary pro policy framework around the zero lower bound, what was the role of unconventional monetary policy and the role of financial conditions that have been increasingly important in decision making by various monetary policy committees. Uh, so a, a final couple of points is, and again, this is a, a matter of how uh, stable the data is over such a long period, is that some of the stationarity or non-stationarity assumptions uh, are harder or easier to reject uh, depending on the sample that you take. In particular, I want to make two points. One is the real interest rate. Uh, there are many people, Larry Summers in front of everybody, that argue that uh, certainly since the 1980s, uh, the real interest rate has not been stationary. Uh, it's actually trended, not just not stationary. Uh, so that's something you know, to, to reflect on. And uh, other people have shown that instead inflation, at least CPI inflation, since the uh, stabilization of the mid 80s has been stationary, at least it's much harder to reject uh, non-stationarity than it used to be. So finally, given I only have two minutes, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the policy implications. As I, as I mentioned, if the neo fisherian view of monetary policy is right, we have been dealing with zero lower bound essentially upside down. So you can think about QE and forward guidance as something very close to a non-transitory shock to the nominal interest rate. So to some extent, QE works because convinces markets that you are gonna keep the interest rate low for a long time. That's together with compression in, in, in term premia is why you get lower long-term rates. And forward guidance certainly is designed exactly with the purpose. So if, if these two measures were credible and the neo fisherian view is right, they have been deflationary rather than inflationary. So let me try to do a mental experiment and to say, you know, do no harm. So what if we are at a zero lower bound and we raise rates and the neo fisherian view is wrong? Well, you would argue that you plunge the economy into a deeper recession and deflation. What if you don't, and the new Fisherian view is right? Well, now you have a prolonged period of low inflation and sluggish growth. So I think depending on how risk averse you are, uh, you had to pick one of these two poisons in, in conditions of uncertainty. Uh, so the alternative would be, what if it is hard to commit credibly to a higher interest rate? Can you change inflation target? Well, may, you would achieve in these in this estimates very similar results, as I said. Uh, I think the credibility remains an issue even with a higher inflation target because it's timing consistent for the central bank. If there is a cost in having a higher inflation target, once you have inflation going higher, uh, to stop doing that and not bringing it back up. So I'll stop here. I have 40 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Wampa.
No, you go. Oh, yeah, you go. You'll have to store your uh, okay. your anger. <laughs> oh, I have a watch here. That's. Okay, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. My second time in Korea. Uh, first time I came in with my wife. Second, not, and she's very jealous. No. Uh, so thanks for the, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's actually, this has not been coordinated for, between Martin and me, I guess. But we're from the same country. We went to the same school. I'm a little bit older. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about essentially very, very similar things. Uh, I'm going to call one that what he did one illustration, and I'm going to do two. But the one I'm going to, one of them is going to be the same he did. Um, so the usual disclaimer: I work for the Fed. Nothing I say uh, represents the views of the Fed, or the system, the Minneapolis Fed, or anybody else. Um, so. Actually, I want, to, I want to start with the, with the part that the conference does not include, which is the past. So if you look at, at, at past inflation, I've just, I just picked a few OECD countries that my RA found complete data uh, when, when I started doing this. The red line is, is average inflation. The blue lines are some type of standard deviations on, on, on that to show what, what, what inflation was in here. So, uh, so this is what happened right after uh, the break of the, of the Bretton Woods system, 1971. Inflation went up pretty much everywhere. We had a decade of, uh, of, uh, of high inflation, but then it came down, uh, and the volatility of inflation across countries also came down. Okay, so this, this is the last six decades of, of evidence on, on inflation. So I'm gonna call this an, an amazing success. So we, since minus infinity till 1971, we had some form of nominal anchor, nominal anchor, but then we dropped it and we only paid some high inflation uh, for, for a decade. And now we're running uh, central banks that are amazingly efficient in terms of controlling inflation to the point that if we show inflation rates for these countries like five years or 20 years from now to an observer, he would have very, very hard troubles identifying the 2007-2008 crisis. So... Uh, I, I, I feel proud to be part of a profession that has given all these beautiful goodies to society without society being fully aware of them. <laughs> so what I want to argue here is that if we want to understand this rise in inflation, like if I had to explain it to my mom, uh, its eventual conquest and the essential role of central banks in doing it is sufficient to appeal to a very old theoretical tradition, which is the quantity theory of money. So these are names you all know. I meant all. I really meant all. I started with Adam Smith, uh, and then uh, uh, mentioning it somehow. And then David Hume, Irvin Fisher, Friedman, with the restatement in the 50s, and Sidorowski and Lucas, among others, basically blend into the dynamic general equilibrium theory we're working now. So, and I'm just going to give you a model, uh, and uh, the model is going to be a, a particular example of what I mean by, by quantity theory of money. The model is going to abstract from almost everything you think that matters for monetary policy. Uh, and of course, that doing I mean, central banking is a very complicated task. Uh, I have the sense that staff at central banks might be a little bit more than what we actually need in the world. But we certainly need a lot of people uh, worrying about it. There's, uh, it's, it's really complicated. We don't exactly understand how expectations are formed, and we're trying to do the best we can. And we do a great job. Uh, but then once you do the day-to-day, -day, it's kind of tempting to think that these artificial models uh, that abstract too much from reality, they're not, they're not that useful. And uh, what I want to do in the paper is to make a case against falling into that temptation. So essentially, the model I'm going to give you is, 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 has a perfectly functioning markets, uh, infinitely lived agents, which are fully rational and they're completely identical. I'm going to come up to completely identical at some point. Uh, and they have perfect information regarding how the economy works. Nothing, I mean, that looks like anything we see around in any country. And 
When we work out these models, the impact of monetary policy shocks uh, very much depend on details, uh, details that are going to be completely absent in my abstraction. Uh, and minor changes in that abstraction can change the way those shocks uh, affect the economy. But uh, to understand medium term inflation, and I put medium in question mark, medium is going to be three years for me. When people say the quantity theory only works in the long run, I say yes, but that's three years. And actually, Martino's numbers are completely consistent with mine, even though he may not be aware of it. Except perhaps that the nominal interest rate is at zero. So that's, that's a part of my, the part of the quantity theory Martin didn't show you is not going to work that well for me when the nominal interest rate is zero. We have theoretical reasons for that, and empirically it's going to show up. So what I'm going to do in the paper is to separate the data between a short run and a medium run. Medium because it's going to be three years. Uh, and this is a, what, what Lucas did in his two illustrations of the quantity theory of money paper in 1980, which this paper alludes to. It's been followed by Benatti, Sargent, Zurico. And the separation involves us using a statistical filter. Now what I'm going to do is use a different filter. Uh, I'm going to have one theoretical implication which is going to be different from what these other papers have done. And essentially, I'm going to bring more countries and more data. That's, that's all I do. So what I'm going to do is very briefly discuss the model and the implications. I'm going to tell you what filter I'm going to use. And then I'm going to show you the data for a relatively large, I mean, relatively large. I right? have like 10, 12 countries. So I'm going to depart from Bob Hall. I'm, not, I'm going to claim that the world might be complicated, but if you want to understand inflation, it's extremely simple. And then I can go beyond the U.S. and look at many, many countries in the world. Then you, what you can do is to get a model that central banks use, apply the same filter and techniques. I'm going to skip that because uh, I, only, I only have 20 minutes. And then I'm going, to talk, I'm going to go back and talk about policy for a minute. So this is going to be the model. Labor only, no capital representative agent. Those are the preferences. It's going to be complete markets here. X is the is is consumption good. And then it, uh, these agents are going to be endowed with a unit of time. Uh, and then they can use it to produce goods, which is going to be L for labor. And then the rest, 1 minus L, is going to be used to carry out transactions. Technology is going to be linear on, on labor. And then there's going to be a cost of making portfolio adjustments. So you can, ex you can exchange interest-bearing assets for money, uh, but you have to pay a cost. And the cost is going to be theta plus epsilon. I need some shocks uh, uh, around there. And n is the number of, of, of portfolio adjustments that you make. So then in equilibrium, what you, the time that you don't use for work, that's one minus L, is going to be the total time that you use in order to make these uh, portfolio adjustments. So if the names of Bomol Tobin come up to your mind now, that's Good. And then there's going to be a cash in advance constraint. I'm going to impose that transactions must be made with cash. And then what you have on the left-hand side is the value of, of transactions. And on the right-hand side is the stock of money times the number of times uh, that you make these, these portfolio adjustments. So if you solve this model, assuming that the nominal interest rate is zero, this model becomes funny when the nominal interest rate is zero, uh, essentially because then this last equation is not going to be binding. Uh, and then we can get multiplicity and, 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 and weird theoretical stuff. And here's where the, where, where the representative agent model is kind of tricky because you, can, you have it perfectly behaved for positive interest rate, but at zero, it becomes weird. So it would be fun to get Greg involved into doing the zero bound with heterogeneity uh, uh, at some point, uh, and then maybe in the next conference. Greg didn't know I was going to say this. So... If you, but if you assume away from the zero bound, then you get the standard square root formula of Bomol Tobin, which in growth rates gives you that inflation is equal to money growth minus the growth rate of output plus a half of the growth rate of nominal interest rates. No parameters to estimate. So I'm not going to estimate them. Just an unobservable shock. So essentially, I, all these are observables, except for the shock. Now, in addition, we get the Fisher equation. And here's a little bit trickier because we do observe nominal interest rate, we do observe inflation, but we don't see real rate in the, for, for all the countries I want to look at. Uh, so essentially what I'm going to do, this is going to be my identifying assumption. It's not true, but it's useful. I'm going to assume there is integrated capital markets, which means that the real rates are going to be the same for all the countries I'm going to be looking at from 1960 to now. Uh, and then I'm going to use the U.S., to compute the real rate, and then I'm going to use that real rate for all the other countries. Okay? So that's what, uh, what, what I was saying here. 
So I'm going to use, so of course we can do better. Uh, but essentially what I want to argue is that we can make some marginal improvements, but the big picture when I explain it to my mom, this is going to be good enough. So the filter I'm going to use, the Hosrick Prescott filter, I'm not, I'm not an innovator. I'm not innovating here either. Uh, so the, 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 the nice thing of this, of this filter is that it's controlled by a single parameter. And then what I'm going to do, so, the, the, the only, so depending on the parameter, I leave more stuff in what I'm going to call short run. And the way I'm going to go is I'm going to use what at the Fed we believe as tightening cycles as the definition of what my parameter has to be. So what I want to do is remove the tightening cycles. I'm going to claim ignorance about that short run. And that short run is going to be when the Fed increases the rate. Today I learned that maybe I should be talking about temporary changes. I, I really like the, the composition between permanent and temporary changes that, that Martin proposed. I'm, I'm, I don't want to claim I get there, but I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. Okay, so, but this is the way I want you to think about it. Nominal interest rates move, but sometimes they increase it and everybody's kind of perceiving that the Fed is going to lower them because they're doing, responding to some cyclical thing. And that's what we call tightening cycles. In order to remove those, I need a parameter which is equal to 100, which is larger than the business cycle literature that would use 6.5. This is yearly data. I'm looking at Ellen, which of course said I'm using the wrong number. And the, so these are going to be longer durations. So essentially I'm going to be is having periods which are a little bit longer than what the RBC literature would say, but not that much, and I'm going to show it to you. So the blue line is the nominal interest rate in the U.S. from 1960 to 2016. And what I want to remove are those wiggles in, uh, in, in the, the Volcker wiggle, the second Volcker wiggle, and the two Grispan wiggles. Uh, and then if you do the business cycle one, you get the red one, which is still is kind of dancing a little bit with the wiggles. I want to remove those. I'm going to use 100. And then I get the black line. Okay, so that's what I'm going to be using. Now, if you look at the high-frequency components, they're very, very similar. Okay, by taking a stand on a particular filter, I can take a stand on my definition of medium run. I can count the average number of cycles. The, 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 the cycles there, the average uh, uh, is going to be three years. The maximum cycle is going to be six years. The minimum is going to be equal to one. So those, that, that's what you get. So that's why I'm going to be thinking of three years. Actually, if you look at Martin's, Impulse responses after a permanent and a transitory shock that he showed at the end, they basically become equal to each other after 12 quarters, which is equal to my three years. We didn't coordinate that. Okay, this is going to be a bunch of OECD countries. I'm going to show you the U.S. because the U.S. is the one I'm going to identify to know what the real rate is. And then I'm going to test the two, the two implications for the other countries. Test will mean I'm going to show you pictures. So it's going to be like, this is, these are my grandnephews, and I'm going to show you pictures of my grandnephews. And this is pretty much going to be a beauty contest. There's not going to be any standard deviation. I'm going to tell you my pictures are beautiful. And because they are my grandnephews, of course they are. Whether you like them or not, it's your call. So whatever, that's what I'm going to do. So this is data for the U.S. You already know. This is the nominal interest rate, and that's inflation. So this is what I'm going to use in order to identify the real rate. So if you do the filtering of the real business cycle, you get this, which, of course, you still see a little bit of the wiggles. If you use the 100, which I'm using to remove the tightening cycles, this is what you get. So now if we look at the difference between the blue and the red, this is going to be my estimate for the real rate for all the other countries. Now, I still can test, test the quantity theory of money on the U.S. data, and this is what I have. The blue is money growth minus output growth. The red is inflation. And this is what you get when you filter. And you say, well, come on, that's ugly at the end. Yeah. Two reasons. First, the HP filter is kind of tricky at the end, but also we get the zero bound there. Which I already told you my theory is a little bit weak, and I need to work out on that. I still haven't. If I cut the sample in 2007, then this is what I get. So to me, there is no question of what created the inflation of the 70s and what created the stabilization that came after that. So now, these are pictures. So I will remain silent. I'm going to give you 20 seconds for each country. I'm going to make a couple of comments for some of them. Maybe 20 seconds is too much. So the left one is the data. The right one is the one filtering with my lambda parameter. Oh, Japan, here's when I make some comments. You see what happens in the 2000s? That's, again, the zero bound. 
My money demand is funny at the zero bound. I, we, 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 we need to work on that. Now we have a bunch of data. Until 2007, we only had the very recent data of Japan, and we had some data in the Second World War for the U.S. Now we have plenty of data for the zero bound and the behavior of money demand to, to think about. We, have, we already have, some, we have done some work, and, and, and clearly what we find, and this is with a serious econometrician, with Luca Venati uh, and, and, and some others. Uh, Luca Venati is the only econometrician. Uh, and tip, uh, pretty much the data is asking for a bounded number at zero. So the log-log equation is not going to work well, uh, which is the one I'm using here. So, uh, okay, this is South Korea, so I have to say something. So this is, this is also an example of an amazingly well run. This looks like a little bit I'm violating the incentive compatibility constraint because I was invited by the Bank of Japan. But, but this is an example of what I told you before how central banking gave all these goodies to, to society without society acknowledging that. So, so enough, I would say, at least. Okay, so what? Uh, how relevant is this for policy? And I'm, I'm going to end up where Martin ended up in the end, so we, we, we could have skipped my paper altogether. Uh, let me give you three cases, and then I'm going to claim that I have something to say about two of them only. So I'm going to talk about the U.S. in the first two. So in, in, if you look at in the second half of 2016, inflation rate was in the U.S. was kind of, it was kind of on the low side, but it was going up to 2%. Which was pretty good because it was uh, uh, that year in which we said 2% was going to be the target. Now, uh, at the beginning of 2017, then it started to revert and it started to go down. And it went down to 1.3 by August of, of, of 2017. Uh, sorry, no, no, we, we declared the target much before. I confused. I, I, I'm, I, I made a mistake with the next example. So uh, inflation was going up to 2 by the end of 2016 and it started going down to 1.3 2017. <clears throat> that was the time in which we were actually increasing the rate, so there was a question. Is this responding to the increase in the rate? Was it going to happen? So the analysis of this paper is completely helpless in trying to address that. We're talking about six months, one year differences. I, I don't know. But in January 2012, when we announced the target of 2%, we were, inflation was going to that number, and actually it reached 2% in April of 2012. So that we declared success, but then it started falling in April, and it was 1.5 by the end of 2012. And it never went back to two. If you look at the, from 2012 to now, it has basically averaged in 1.6. If we look at core, which is the one that we, that we look, at least in the Minneapolis Fed. So essentially, what I'm arguing is that the analysis of the spacemer tells me this is a six-year period. If we had had, on average, the interest rate 40 basis points above, we would have been in the target. And then, uh, to, 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 to finish, uh, I wanted to go back to Japan. And this is going to be very similar to what Martin said for, for different reasons. So the, there was this concern, actually, uh, the, 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 it, it was mentioned about the stagnation and the long period of, of low inflation in Japan. Uh, so what I'm doing, I'm zooming on the plot of the Fisher equation for Japan. And I'm adding one line. So the black line is the nominal interest rate in Japan. Filter with my lambda equals to 100, okay? That's the, that's, the plot, that's the one you didn't have before. Then what we have, the red one, is inflation. And the blue one is if what inflation should be according to my theory. Because according to my theory, what I have to do is I have to get the nominal interest rate in Japan and subtract the real rate in the U.S. Or what I'm calling the real rate in the international markets. Yeah, my theory is not that good. It's missing it. But what my theory is saying is that starting in the middle of the 2000s, my theory says that inflation should have been going up in Japan. Why? Because the real interest rate was going down in international markets, including then Japan, according to my identifying assumption. And we actually see inflation going up in Japan at the end of the sample. So according to this view, the reason why inflation went up in Japan and improved in the last few years is because the real rate is very low. But as long as the nominal interest rate starts, keeps on being at 
the, the black line at zero. And to the extent that real rates start going up, as we see doing it in the US in the last year, then what this theory says is that in the next five years, Japan is not going to have a higher inflation rate. It's going to have a lower inflation rate unless it raises the permanently the nominal interest rate. Okay, good. One coup. Thank you, Professor Sargent. Thank you, Dr. Nicolini, for very interesting presentations. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Hwan Gu Kang from the Bank of Korea. Let me. Uh, briefly uh, explain my contents. First, I'd like to um, uh, explain two important background papers of this paper, and then I will mention three contributions of the paper, then I will give you four comments for this paper, and I'll give you three more further thoughts about this paper. So first, background of this paper. There are, as you know, um, the very most important two papers. One is uh, Professor Milton Friedman's 1956 paper titled The Quantity Theory of Money, a Restatement. Maybe the first rigorously written statement of, of the quantity theory after uh, long periods of verbal tradition of Chicago School. And Dr. Nicolini already mentioned, but I would like to, like to emphasize again, that the very successful central banking in recent history were possible because we followed Professor Friedman's monetary framework and his proposal for monetary policy. Second and direct background paper is Professor Robert E. Lucas Jr.'s 1980 paper titled Two Illustrations of the Quantity Theory of Money. In this paper, Professor Lucas explains what the two illustrations of the quantity theory of money are. He said, a given change in the rate of change in the quantity of money induces one unequal change in the rate of price inflation to an equal change in nominal rates of interest. So the first relationship could be called money demand equation or money neutrality. The second is the Fisher equation. So now I'd like to mention three contributions of this paper. The first contribution is that it derived explicitly the two illustrations of the quantity theory of money from a simple but fully dynamic general equilibrium monetary model with cash in advance constraint and transaction cost assumption included in the model, Dr. Nicolini neatly derived the de money demand equation and Fisher equation. And second, it provided some persuasive empirical evidence for QTM with OECD countries data since 1960. As we saw from Dr. Nicolini's presentation, there were very high correlation for low frequency relationship for most OECD countries. The third contribution is that it provided us with some useful framework for model simulation. That could be a good starting point to test quantity theory money in various environments. So it could give us give some very good opportunity to re-examine QTM more carefully and re-appreciate its real value. Now let me make some actually four comments of this paper. My first comment is about the assumption of integrated capital market. And based on this uh, assumption, Dr. Nicolini assumed that all countries' real interest rate are the same as U U.S. rate and applied U.S. real rate to each country's fiscal equation. As Dr. Nicolini already said, this is clearly problematic. Each country has different levels and dynamics of real interest rate. 
Moreover, we may not need to use real interest rate to test fissure equation because it is about the relationship between nominal interest rate and inflation rate. So it could be enough if you compare directly nominal interest rate and inflation rate by using regression techniques or model simulation. My second comment is about the assumption of complete market. With a complete market assumption, we get QTM and Fisher equation as a long-term equilibrium phenomenon. Here, the nominal interest rate is a long-run equilibrium price is determined in a complete and frictionless economy. So according to QTM, money supply will increase inflation rate, and Fisher equation says it will increase nominal interest rate if the money supply does not help the real economy to grow. But in policy circle, we are always talking about the liquidity effect and Taylor rule. If enough money or liquidity is supplied, interest rate should go down, the liquidity effect. And Taylor rule says if you decrease short-run policy rate, which is equivalent to increased money supply in open market operation, your inflation will go up. So the direction of the effect and causation are different from QTM and Fisher equation. So what does it tell us? According to Professor Alvarez and Lucas 2001, we need a segmented market assumption for liquidity effect to hold. Then we can ask, what does QTM mean in a segmented market where liquidity effect holds? I think it tells us that to fully understand the policy implications from QTM, liquidity effect, and Taylor rule, we need a more clear distinction between short run and long run, between complete market and segmented market assumption, and between nominal interest rate as a market price and nominal interest rate as a policy rate. Also, these distinctions are more than important when you look at the raw data or filtered data or estimates from the model simulation. I will mention these issues later when I give some comments on the empirical results. My third comment is about the filtering technique. As we all know, when you apply any kind of filtering technique, we get the endpoint problem. So if we compare the filtering results of US data for QTM before GFC, the right figure, and after GFC, the left one, we can see the seriousness of that problem after 2000. As, as Dr. Nicolini already said, this is, of course, because U.S. monetary policy after GFC was unconventional, constrained by zero lower bound or quantitative easing. To get over this problem, not completely but partially, we need some robustness check by using various econometric techniques. In addition, it is important to keep in mind that the empirical test of country-specific QTM depends on its own government policy change. As Professor Sargent and Suriko said in 2011, we need to consider policy regime change when we do the empirical test for some propositions so that we can distinguish when the proposition will obtain in reality and when, when they will break down. My last comment is about the empirical results of the test of QTM at near zero lower bound. I mentioned two cases, U.S. and Japan. First, in case of U.S., since 2010, short-run policy rate was almost zero due to series of QE policy, and inflation rate was uh, below target, but above, above the zero policy rate. Is this clear opposition to QTM or Fisher equation? I do not think so. I think this is the case where the proposition broke down because of the con unconventional monetary policy. So in order to test QTM or Fisher equation, we need to wait until zero policy rate converges to long-run equilibrium market rate after the end of unconventional monetary policy. Second, Japanese case during the last 20 years. This is more challenging case to answer. By low frequency comparison, Fisher equation looks good, the right figure, but the QTM is pretty bad, 
the left figure. Money growth rate was way higher than inflation rate through the last 20 years. In this case, we cannot wait more until the unconventional market equilibrium relationship occur, since we already waited for 20 years. Then we need to think of what happened during the last 20 years and what we should do to recover the conventional relationship. So I think one possible answer could be obtained by thinking of the structural changes such as population aging and its effect on inflation dynamics, as Professor Shirakawa suggested to us in 2012 speech. And Professor Shirakawa said in 2012 speech for uh, Bank of Japan IAMS conference that Japanese population aging started since 1990s, but the public remained unaware of the danger from the structural change. During that time, the economy was weakened, and when the people started to feel the effect of population aging, they faced more decline in aggregate demand and then in aggregate supply. So inflation rate went to down. If this is the case, can we say that QTM failed in Japan during the last 20 years? I might say that QTM did break down, not fail during the time of the structural change. Lastly, I will very briefly explain uh, some of my for further thoughts. The budget constraint has been violated, but I don't know what bad's going <laughs> to so, Can I go on? <laughs> Yeah, he's given you okay. some time. Yeah. Thank you. One minute. So we can think of some simple policy implications from this case. Um, we could think of two simple propositions, very simple, so it may not be so practical in terms of the policy. But I'd like to say that the first one could be if it seem, if, if it seems that quantitative easing does not work for a very long time, consider policy for structural reform. The second one, if QTM works after some period of unconventional monetary policy, be ready to normalize nominal interest rate. My second thought is about inflation measure. Can we model asset price inflation dynamics in QTM? Can we consider financial stability in QTM framework? I think the answer may depend on how we measure inflation. So the answer could depend on how we measure inflation or where we measure inflation. My last thought is about the digital currency. What could QTM mean in a world, of, world with digital money? How can we measure monetary aggregates and inflation in a digitalized world? What could be the new concept of transaction cost in the digital economy? All these are very difficult questions, but I believe Dr. Nicolini's paper could be a very good starting point for thinking about these challenging issues. Thank you. Okay, what we're going to have is, uh, according to the rules, uh, Martina is going to have five minutes to respond, and uh, Wampa is going to have... Two and a half minutes to respond. <laughs> okay. So, um, no, I would like to thank uh, the uh, discussant for excellent um, comments. Um, so, one question is whether the, the shock, the permanent shock, I am estimating the permanent monetary shock is an interest rate shock or a inflation target shock? And um, in order to answer to, for that question to be well-defined, one has to understand what an inflation target is, or at least define it. So my permanent monetary shock is a random variable that is co-integrated with inflation and the nominal interest rate, by definition. Uh, is that an inflation target shock? I'm going to give you three, briefly, three definitions of an inflation target that you're going to be, you're going to find, I'm sure, familiar, two of which 
cannot necessarily be associated with my shock. And one of them could be associated, but in, in the third definition, it doesn't matter because an inflation target shock and a permanent interest rate shock would be exactly the same object. So definition number one, an inflation target is whatever the monetary authority states its, its inflation target, either explicitly or implicitly by, say, the minutes of each meeting. Under this definition, clearly the inflation target is not the permanent component of observed inflation and the interest rate. An example is Japan. For the past 25 years, they have had inflation levels and interest rate levels that are, in particular inflation, way below where the central bank would have liked to see it. Definition number two, the inflation target is a coefficient in an interest rate feedback rule. A familiar version of an interest rate feedback rule is an interest rate feedback rule of the Taylor type, where as the, whereby the interest rate is set, among other factors, uh, as a function of the difference between some measure of inflation and the coefficient that is often referred as the inflation target, that coefficient could be a constant coefficient or could be a random variable. Is that the permanent component of inflation? Is that my permanent monetary shock? And the answer is not necessarily. In the past 25 years, we have seen models written down in which there is a standard model, say a neo-Keynesian model or a flexible price model, and the monetary authority follows the Taylor type interest rate rule with an inflation target as I just defined it. And nonetheless, the economy falls chronically in, for example, a liquidity trap in which the inflation rate is permanently different from that definition of the inflation target, from that coefficient. So that can clearly not necessarily be associated with the shock I identify. Definition number three, the inflation target is the permanent component of inflation, which is my definition. So in that case, talking about an inflation target shock or talking about the permanent interest rate shock is exactly the same thing. So you can call it either way. I'm, I'm fine with that. That would be the same definition that, say, what Tom Sargent and his co-authors, uh, Tim uh, Cogley and Primicieri and others, call, for instance, core inflation. So um, again, in closing, and that, that this is the end of my entire comments, uh, when we talk about inflation target, we have to really have in mind exactly what we mean by an inflation target. Otherwise, uh, com comparisons uh, don't, don't, don't make sense. Thank you. So, Wampa? Okay, thanks. Uh, I have four minutes then. I gave away one. Okay, I'm wasting another one. <laughs> so thank you very much. I said, so, uh, sometimes I say when we do quantity theory, and I feel like saying when I do, because this is not very fashionable to do. So I, I really like when somebody engages in the, in the, in, in the game as, uh, as, uh, as my discussant. Um, so let me go briefly to two or three things. Uh, so in terms of, of the assumption, one, I mean, assuming that it's integrated capital markets and then real rates are going to be the same, it's just a, uh, a device to be able to have a sharp forecast for inflation within my model. I mean, it's not that I think it's, 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 it's true. I, can even, I could try to say, well, 
in the 70s, maybe the real rates in Korea were higher, and then I could do better with my plots. I, I, I purposely didn't do that because I wanted to make the exercise extremely transparent and clean. So when you look at the beauty of my pictures, you know exactly what I did, and there's no hidden playing around with the, with, the, with the data. But of course, one could do better by trying to get estimates country by country to do that. And I, I'm fully aware that some of the, of the, of the differences are going to can be, can be explained by that. In terms of the liquidity effects and segmented markets, exactly. That's what I'll try to do at the end with some models and then show that you can change the degree of this friction, the segment, how, how, how segmented are markets, or how sticky are prices, but still when you filter out the data, you get pretty much beautiful pictures as I do with the, with, with the data. So I'm, I'm, I'm all on board with that. Um, let me go back to the zero bound, and, and let me go back to Japan, because I, 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 I want to, to, to insist on that point. Uh, so I'm, uh, one of the... Okay, one of the reasons that my, my pictures with the quantity of money that's badly is that uh, it's like we, don't, we don't really have very good theories and, and, and discipline by data on how the, 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 or how, how the behavior at zero is. And what we, when we look at that one in Japan, we get exactly that the, 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 the picture is bad. That's not a good picture. But what the picture is telling us is that it, it, the picture is forecasting much higher inflation in Japan than what we see. The way to think about it in terms of the theory is that the Japanese are holding much more money than what the simple theory says. Uh, so the, one I, the thing I would worry about Japan eventually, once they lift, is what happens with all this money. And maybe uh, these pictures are telling us that there should be, or I would have at least some concerns on what to do with these aggregates if eventually Japan starts doing these permanent increases on the nominal interest rate that Martin and I think is the way to get inflation up. Um, I don't think it has anything to do with unconventional monetary policy. And on this, I'm going to disagree with, 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 with my discussion. And, uh, and, and I think it's just, uh, and, and for that, I, I, that's why I think that the, the, the plot on the Fisher equation is much more illustrative. Again, my view of why inflation went up a little bit in Japan in the last five years is because the real rate went down. That's the only way you can do it if you keep the nominal interest rate at zero. So with all due respect, I'm going to, I'm going to dissent uh, with, with my discussion and with Professor Shirikawa. Uh, I don't think inflation is going to come up with, it's, going to, it's not going to be higher in Japan in the next decade unless the nominal interest rate is permanently higher in the next decade. And that's what I tried to, to do when I said, let's not try to fall into temptation. Uh, to me, thinking about demographic issues is falling into temptation. Is demography is important, let's look at 60 countries. Let's see how demography affected inflation in those countries. My simple plots are telling me what affects inflation is monetary policy. And uh, I, I don't want to fall into temptation of saying it's demography. And I'm done. I owe you five seconds. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so my assignment now is to open this up to uh, to questions and and uh, statements from the from the floor. So I'm doing that now. So put up your hand and so Marco. So this is a question for uh, Dr. Nicolini, um, uh, following up actually on what Dr. Kang was mentioning about monetary aggregates. There's a question exactly what um, measure of money you're going to use. I went to the paper and noticed that you're using cash for the United States. But one of the issues with cash, of course, is that uh, in principle uh, the, um, the Fed uh, is uh, um, being, uh, forced to convert uh, excessive service into cash on demand and vice versa. And that's been the uh, modus operandi for many of uh, the central banks around the world. So the balance sheet has not been uh, had just a, um, cash on, uh, on the liability side. So there's a question about how you control that. Um, if that's your measure. Um, and so in general, there's a trade-off between what's stable and what's controllable. Yeah, should I go now, Tom? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, David, that's a great question. Uh, a big issue, and I think that has been at the heart of, uh, of why monetary aggregates stopped being even looked at 
in, 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 in central banks is that uh, it's hard to come up with the right measure. I, I, in the past, I've tried to use theory to bring light into that, and we had had some success, at least in explaining transactional demand for money in the U.S., trying to develop models that help us think on what is it that you want to put us, us, uh, as money. Precisely because in the U.S. we had a regulatory changes in the 80s that completely changed the distinction between uh, some savings deposits and some uh, demand deposits. And, as it, and that's our interpretation of why the money demand of M1 went uh, uh, unstable in the 80s in the U.S. That's why I use cash for the, for the U.S. in this particular case. Because these are the other measures, they have these structural breaks in the 80s. Now, in terms of how do you control that, uh, there might be legal constraints on how you, on, on how you do it, but at the end of the day, uh, that's, that's the, the, the monopoly right of issuing must be what you have to use in order to control that aggregate. Ricardo? It's a question from Martin. Um, in the U.S., for the last six, seven years, we've had the summary of economic projections where the board members announce what their interest rate will be or they expect it to be 10 years from now. So that would correspond to your permanent, um, I think, um, your permanent shocks to the interest rate. Now, those have had zero shocks for a long time. So I wanted to check first whether your VAR also gets zero shocks as a permanent component. If we think that they're answering credibly, it should, but there will be a check and identification. But secondly, also point that in many ways you could then say that the the Board of Governors has been near Fisherian because in the last year and a half, they've revised down their measures of the real interest rate. And as a result, in order to be consistent with a 2% inflation target, they've lowered their 10-year ahead uh, forecast of the nominal interest rate. Uh, they've indeed introduced, given the perception that there's a, a permanently lower real interest rate, they've lowered their permanent a measure or at least statement of what their nominal interest rate would be in order to be consistent with a 2% inflation target. So at least in their actions in the last 18 months, the Fed has been near for sure and exactly along the lines you've said. But again, but the question is on whether um, this matches your VAR, given that you estimate during this period. <clears throat> so um, this is the inferred historical path of my permanent monetary shock. Um, if you are familiar with, for instance, Tom Sargent's papers with uh, Tim Cogley, a series of papers with Tim Cogley and Tim Cogley and Primicheri and others, other authors, um, <clears throat> this lines up, I think, very closely with what uh, Tom gets. So um, the answer is, is, is no. Uh, uh, there has been a lot of movement in the permanent component of the interest rate and inflation since the post-war. Um, in, in particular, uh, inflationary, long-run inflation shocks started, you know, way before the oil shocks in the 60s. And then all of the Volcker intervention was interpreted as, um, as temporary increases in the interest rate because, you know, the permanent component was systematically uh, falling during that, um, that time. So I'm going to leave that. Uh, since Japan is uh, often mentioned, uh, I feel obliged to, to say something. Uh, I recall the episode uh, in mid-1980s. Uh, Milton Friedman uh, praised Bank of Japan monetary policy in his paper, which appeared in General Money and Credit and Banking. In those days, uh, inflation rate in Japan is low and stable. On top of that, growth of material aggregate is so stable. That's why he held the Bank of Japan monetary policy. Then the bubble and the passing bubble ensued. And then we are talking about why Japan was experiencing this kind of situation for two decades. And, but when it comes to two decades rather than uh, two years or three years, we have to think about real sides as well as uh, we, we have to talk about not only material side but also uh, real side. And in this respect, uh, we have to think more about the long-run issues uh, 
pertaining to potential growth rate. And in this regard, <laughs> I'm not saying that material policy is nothing to do with real side. Uh, you frame this question in terms of liability side of banks, that is money. But at the same time, there's a corresponding item, that is credit. So in those days of bubble economy, the, <laughs> the bank lending was the destined to real estate market. And this time around, the credit is going to government bond. And uh, eventually, the, the, there's a link between credit allocation and uh, uh, the efficient allocation of resources, potential growth rate. So uh, we have to think of more of many issues pertaining to uh, long-term growth. And, uh, and that's my response to the remarks. Thank you. Just a clarification. Is, uh, I, 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 I might have been misleading. I, have not, I was not making any statement about growth of output. Yeah, yeah. That, not just to make... Yeah. Andy? Sorry. Flip a coin. <laughs> oh, great presentations. But I'd have to say that many in the central banking world don't look particularly kindly to this uh, neo fisherian view of inflation determination. And I was just thinking, because I came in with a fairly skeptical opinion, but after hearing Bob Hall's talk today, I was wondering in looking at your equations, what is your interest rate and what are you trying to capture in here? Because the phenomena you're looking at are basically the 1970s, crisis period, just came off Bretton Woods, another, uh, a number of other things going on. In the last 10 years, of course, we had the global financial crisis. So this is a time when you think that the discount rate might be moving around in the way that Bob Hall was talking about, that that rate went up, people became more short, cited, and they saw a lot of forecast errors. In the 70s, it was forecast errors of inflation on the upside, and in the last decade, it's forecast errors on the downside. And so if you become more short-sighted and you're just looking at short-run dynamics of inflation, you might run into the sort of situation that central banks find them, themselves today, which is they don't seem to be able to push expectations up because it's not rational expectations, but some form of rational beliefs with high discounting. I was wondering if that's a hypothesis that would square with some of the ideas that you're talking about. Uh, just that for, for full disclosure, Andy also came, went to the same school that we went with, uh, with, with Martin. Um, I don't know. I, I'm going to insist on don't fall into temptation. I'm showing my Christian origins here. Uh, but... Uh, if those shocks in the discount rate would be, I'm going to talk about Martin's paper too, would be on the, on the real interest rate that Martin model has. So he's not neglecting those shocks. Uh, he's basically, my reading is putting all those shocks together into the real shock. And the, he lets the data tell them what they are. I'm doing a more simple stuff, which is I'm going to read all those shocks from the U.S. and I'm going to make the naive assumption that it's exactly the same for, for, for everybody else. Um, so so that's, that's the way I would see that particular one. And, and, and that's what I meant by there are, of course, many, many different things. And here I'm completely with Bob Hall, that when you look at the real side, then sometimes you say, okay, I give up. I'm going to just think of only one country. I think that the beauty of the quantity theory of money is that it's simple enough and captures enough of it to get beautiful pictures like this. I'm going to assume they're beautiful, that, as, as the ones I showed. But I want to say one more thing, if Tom doesn't stop me, but it's going to be very brief, which is, there is, okay, Martin has this other paper in the early 2000s in which he's talking about these liquidity traps, which he actually mentioned when he was saying, he's giving a second example of the, of the inflation target, where, in which, the reason you are at zero is because central banks think that the way to, 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 to increase inflation is to lower the nominal interest rates. That's why he's making the distinction between the Fisherian and the neo Fisherian. And if you think in terms of a liquidity trap, and, and if you talk to central bankers, which I do because I talk to myself and to other people, uh, when you tell them if you want to increase inflation, then you have to increase the nominal interest rate, but you are not. But then the reason why it's not really a trap in terms of the, of the functionings of the model, it is pretty much a trap because of the Taylor rule, 
that is embedded in the, in the, in the, in the paper of Martin, Steffi, and, and, and Jess. And the Taylor rule implies that if, whether what you want to do in order to, to, to increase inflation is to lower the rate. But when you are at zero, you cannot do it, and then you're stuck there. But the reason you're stuck is because you're imposing the Taylor rule. If you just remove the Taylor rule, then the, the, the model doesn't even tell you what inflation is going to be because you still need a policy reaction. So I do understand that it sounds weird, but that's exactly the point. Okay, thanks for the remarks about temptation, too. <laughs> yes. So I have a question, one question about uh, Professor Uribe's paper. So my question is about uh, assumption of structural, uh, symmetric structure of model and uh, identification, identification of permanent monetary and non-monetary shocks. So Japan's last two decades or so, we, are, we have been fighting about deflations, but important lesson is it's very difficult to re-anchor in the inflation expectations around the target level once it's deviating down, downward from the target level and getting very, very low. So and monetary policy is not so effective uh, to, to re-anchor in the inflation expectations. That may be uh, under zero lower bound situations. So it, it seems to me so those uh, mm, assumptions of symmetry structure and identification of permanent shock may be a very important thing. And once the, we assume that some kind of asymmetry, introduced in asymmetric structure in the model, maybe identified permanent shock may be very different. Uh, yes, I think that is a very good uh, question. And, um, and I think it would be a, a very relevant extension of my paper to impose those asymmetries that you refer to, to for instance, reflect the zero lower bound. Um, so I, I fully agree with your comment and your, your concerns. Okay, is there, are there any more suggestions? Um, any more responses? I have a question for Martin if there is time. Yeah. So would the new Keynesian model give you the positive response of output to a permanent shock on the interest rates? Um, I, I think so. I'm, I'm working, I'm working on, on that right now. And um, because if you think, for instance, of a Calvo type model for sticky prices and the government announces a normalization of rates, that is to say an, a permanent increase in rates. And suppose that you are someone who is touched by the ferry and you get to change prices today and you already know that the interest rate is going to be higher in the future, so the Fisher effect is going to kick in at some point, so inflation is going to be higher in the future. If you don't increase prices today, since you are not going to have a chance to increase prices for a while, say three years, then you're going to be, your relative price is going to be unhedged. You know, it's going to be out of, out of, um, it's going to be dislocated. So um, that is the basic intuition for why um, it is not unreasonable to think uh, that um, even in very standard models, that is actually a point that Stephanie and I have made a bunch of papers, even in standard new Keynesian models, it is important to distinguish interest rate shocks that have a permanent component or are transitory in nature because they have very different dynamics for uh, inflation and output. So that exhausts our time. So I'd like to thank um, the discussants and the paper presenters. Thank you very much. <laughs>